Lord, we come into your presence with full assurance of faith, knowing this in our heart, that you first loved us. All the experiences that we have in the new covenant was motivated by your extravagant love. We have come to also reciprocate this love by worshiping your great name. And we ask that your presence might be made manifest and that your name might be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, beginning from verse number 1. Acts chapter 9, from verse number 1. And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether there were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. Hallelujah. I say, Hallelujah. Amen. Now, you will notice that this man, this man began to exercise his displeasure against the people of God. The Bible says that he began to breathe out threats. He began to breathe out slaughter. That means he had an intention to kill Christians. It would, it would be his joy to be, become a weaponized entity against the people of the way. So he was breathing out threats previously, but you see, the threats were empty because there was no possible way for him to fulfill those threats because he did not have the requisite authority from whence to translate his threats into action. Then he went and got letters from the chief priest at Jerusalem. When he got letters from the chief priest at Jerusalem, he now had a platform, a platform from whence to exercise the threats that he had nurtured for a very, very long time. The authority he sought to legitimize his actions in bringing injury to the people of God, he had secured it in the letters that he got from Jerusalem. And this was the first time in the history of Judaism where a militia was raised to ensure compliance with the way of Judaism. I don't want to go into details by telling you the politics that is obtainable in the Jewish ruling council and how that at this time there were two factions in that house and there were Sadducees in that house and Pharisees in that house. I, I don't want to trouble you with the historical perspective of how this Jewish ruling council became a fragmented theological platform. And at the, as at the time that uh, Saul was, was giving these letters from Jerusalem, it was the Pharisees that dominated the house. So it was the effort of the Pharisees that occasioned the setting up of this militia to enforce Judaism among the Jews of all nations. And I'd like you to take note of the marching orders that were prescribed by the letters. 
Are you still with me? All right. The marching orders are in verse number two. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way. So believers those days were called the people of the way because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So they had a nickname among the populace that they were people of the way. So his marching orders that were included in the letter that he sought approval for was that if by any means he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. I have friends in the military and a few of them have gone to represent the United Nations in the war front and there are rules of engagement that a soldier must adopt if he's going to find himself in a war situation. Uh, part of the rules of engagement is that women and children are excluded from the slaughter radar. It's only men that should be killed. But if you check his own letter, the letter that he got from Jerusalem, the immunity that women were supposed to enjoy was not included in his marching orders. Can you? Hallelujah. That if he found what? Men or women. How should we bring them to Jerusalem? He should bring them bound. No one should stroll into the territory. Everyone should come in bound. Are you there? I'm just trying to show you what happens to a man when the man has a platform of authority. That's the same kind of thing that happens to demons when demons secure an, a platform to exercise their authority. First of all, I need to tell you that Satan hates you with passion. I know that's not news, but I, I need to. Many of you are not aware. You forget it. Because you see Satan sometimes putting on spectacles and dark bones, and you think he's coming to take a selfie. <laughs> His agenda has not changed. He's coming to kill, <laughs> to steal, and to destroy. So Satan has been your enemy from time immemorial. The only reason why Satan has not come into your space is because he has not found sufficient authority that will legitimize his intentions for slaughter around your life. Are you there? So you will find that this man was able to find the requisite legal platform that will legitimize his actions and give him an opportunity to translate his empty threats into acts of vengeance, acts of injury, acts of slaughter. Sometimes when you begin to experience peace around your life, it's not because Satan changed. It's not because the devil suddenly became sympathetic to your case. The reason is because he, he has not found the necessary legalities and premise that will give him the opportunity to translate his vengeance over your life. So, Saul was able to secure this authority. And I can imagine, if you, if you have a very sharp imagination like mine, uh, you, I, I'm wondering, when he mounted that horseback, and he was going for his first, uh, it will interest you to know, that his first mission is first mission. That's what the military people call it when you are going from one station to another station to discharge your duties is called a mission are you there so his first mission was international <laughs> he was going to syria <laughs> to enforce the will of the sanhedrin so you could imagine the kind of audacity he had an international passport that was signed and stamped with the syrian visa his first assignment was international. So you could imagine the audacity with which he was making out on that tree. I hope you know because the situation is legal. Oh, you are, you are not with me. You are not, you are not following me. Because the situation is now legal, at this point, prayers cannot stop him. 
Mm. He has, you will need something more than prayer to stop this man. Prayers would have stopped him. It would have been easier for prayer to manipulate his intention to secure the letter. If prayers were, were mounting when he was trying to apply for the letter, maybe prayers can resist the letter from approval. Now, he has approval and the requisite authority has been given unto him. Ah, uh, prayer cannot stop him. I remember once upon a time, a sitting governor in a certain state in Nigeria came up with a bill, and the bill was intended, was the, the bill was, okay, let me not define the bill. The bill was intended to regulate religious activities. One of the prescriptions in the bill was that night prayers were outlawed, amongst many other antichrist um, stuff that way, collocated in that document to bind the people of God. And in that case, indeed, men and women will be brought bound. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he was trying to smuggle that document into the State House of Assembly in order to get the approval of the House for that to become a functional law in the land. Um, it is easier to fight that bill before it becomes law. Are you there? Because the moment it becomes law, <laughs> even prayer cannot fight against it. It will take something more than prayer to stop that malicious attempt at regulating the activities in the house of God. And if the bill had sailed through, guess what? Many other states in the north will follow suit because the trial, the attempt worked. So if we hold meetings and the Holy Spirit moves and the event trespasses, transgresses into somewhere 9 p.m. in the night while we are still laboring to get demons out of the lives of men, we will come how? Bow. <laughs> so, unfortunately for the governor, when he, they put the bill together and we heard about it, we traveled to that place and mounted up a prayer siege. Yes, I, I did that. Not in the spirit, not in dreams. I, I was there physically. I did my own portion as I was instructed of the Lord. So we mounted up a siege and when we gained in ascendancy, we released some verdicts and angels worked on it. And uh, the man now had more problem than the bill. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, some people, the problems that come on some people, are actually God's response to ensure that some form of legitimacy is not secured that will weaponize the intentions of darkness. So what the governor sought that he did not get, Saul got it from the St. Henry. And he had an opportunity to translate his vengeance. Satan is impotent until he secures a legal premise upon which to translate his vengeance. And if you understand what we are talking about, part of what it means to fight spiritually is to undo the legality uh, behind the premise upon which Satan stands. Are you there? Aha. Uh -huh. So the skills involved in that kind of activity are the things we'll be discussing maybe next week if the Lord gives us the opportunity. So this guy was bouncing to Damascus. Syria was his first point of call. And he was going to translate his vengeance. Meanwhile, prior to this time, the Christians were saying, he just has the ability to talk. Now only mouth you get. So he wants to go and prove that he has something beyond the ability to talk. He's been given what? Letters from Jerusalem. So, like I told you, um, 
prayers could not stop him at this time. So the Lord Jesus himself decided to pay him a visit. Because what he had were, what? Letters. And then the man that came to encounter him was the Lord. It was only the Lord that had the capacity to undo the authority of what? Letters. Are you afraid? Let's try again. It was only the Lord that had the authority to undo what? The letters. The letters. So when the Lord came and came into head-on collision with him, he fell off his horse, his high horse of boasting, his high horse of, of bragging. He fell off his horse and he came to the ground. But this was somebody that uh, did not know Jesus. Jesus now says, so, so, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? At least he was able to see in the way he appeared that he was a Lord. That, that early discernment spared his life because the way Jesus appeared, at, if, I, if, if I'm Jesus, the next thing is to just cut his, his neck or do something. So he said, who are you, Lord? So that now restrained Jesus. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Then he now gave him a proverb. It is hard to kick against what? The barbed wire. <laughs> now, so, you know, we did something yesterday. The Lord rebuked you. Uh -huh. So it was the Lord that was coming to rebuke Saul. The Lord himself was the personality that was coming now to rebuke Saul. And Saul passed. The authority that they had previously were the letters. But after the encounter, his authority became the law. So there was a transition from the letters to the law. So when we say the Lord rebuke you, what we are doing is that we are putting the Lord on the stage over and above the ability of our prayers for the Lord himself to make a quick appearance and consider visiting the individuals involved. Because the Lord's authority is superior to the authority that anybody has secured using any form of headship whatsoever to interface and open a window for the devil to exercise vengeance over your life. Please, as you journey in your Christian life, do not forget that powerful phrase, the law rebuke you. All right, so let's move on. So we have seen the first thing that Satan normally exploits in order for him to bring his will on the lives of men. He normally exploits the principle of headship. That's the first thing he exploits. The second thing the devil exploits that is seemingly legitimate is the premise of iniquity. But when I show you four of these things, it will enlarge your scope of attention so that you can deal with issues round about your life, your destiny, and release your potential fully so that your voice can be heard. How many of you still remember what Gideon said? If God be God, where be his miracles that our fathers told us of? It means... That Gideon was in an era where the things the fathers enjoyed was invincible. Satan can set up a siege around your life that will cut off your voice, cut off your possibilities, even though you have great potential because the angel gave him a salutation about his stature in the spirit. Thou mighty man of valor. But a mighty man of valor was hiding to trash wheat because there were systems that Satan had put in place that eclipsed his potential. If you want to do spiritual business, there is something called spiritual intelligence. And that's the reason why I'm doing this series. Because I know where I stopped in my message. 
This digression is to provide us some form of intelligence because the last week of the prayer, we are going to be using all the intelligence we have gathered through the teachings to enforce the will of God. If we lack divine revelation, we are going to walk in darkness. Hallelujah. I'm seeing somebody that looks like my friend. Is that Pastor Chris? What's that white, white strand of gray hair doing there? <laughs> it's been long. <laughs> you are welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay. Are you there with me? All right. So, can we do Exodus chapter 1? Sorry, Exodus chapter 20, verse number 1 to verse number 5. Exodus chapter 20. Our salvation was procured through priesthood. Our redemption was occasioned by sacrifice. The greatest altar that exists is the altar of Calvary. The consequences of goodwill that we experience in terms of fellowship, forgiveness, communion, all of those things are results of priesthood, results of an altar that was set up. The entire framework, the entire framework and the shape of New Testament possibilities is predicated on an altar. Now, altars, according to the Bible, altars are the secret processes through which things are accomplished, especially if they are going to come from the spirit realm and come into the natural realm. So, see, authors have a lot of potentials. We have not, we'll still go back to where I stopped. But you must understand that altars were not only designed to drive the natural realm and to superimpose the influ influence of the invincible realm on the natural realm. That's not all that altars are about. Because by the time I take you to the book of Revelation, you are going to see that in heaven there are altars. The activity of God does not take place but with altars. If I have time and I pray I secure a little time, I'm going to show you a few altars in heaven and give you an operation, a description of how one of them operates. Then you will see that even though God had established his divine purpose before the foundations of the world, even in the spirit realm, he set up altars in order for him to bring the things he has concluded in eternity into the spirit realm before it passes from the spirit realm into time. And at every point in time, you will need altars to actualize this matter. To bring it from eternity into the spirit realm, you need altars. To bring it from the spirit realm into the natural realm, you will need altars. And I will show you one of the altars in heaven so that you will see it from scripture. And the altars are instruments of dominion. If we want to implement policies, we will need altars. Okay. In the book of Exodus chapter 20 verse 1, the Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. It is because God is a jealous God that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, If you have an opportunity anywhere in the Bible where you see God speaking directly, 
you will do well not to ignore God's direct spoken words. Are you there? Whenever you see God in the scripture speaking directly, speaking about himself, speaking about what he will do under, circum under certain circumstances, if you are wise, you will not trivialize utterances that derive from the mouth of God. Now, in this scripture, God gives us an insight, an insight into the kind of person that he is. And what he is unveiling here about himself is that he is a jealous God. If you do business in the world of spirits, you will find that it's not only God that is jealous. But every spirit being whatsoever is a jealous entity. And I'm going to tell you why. You see, these spirit beings, there is only one way they can be known in the natural. The, their effect can be known in the natural. And the way is through men that are consecrated to them. So if a man is totally and absolutely consecrated to God, God has the liberty to exercise his authority over that individual. And the fingerprint of the consequence of communion with God is going to be displayed on that individual. So that individual becomes an advertisement of what to expect when you decide to submit to God. Are you there with me? Oh, you're not there with me. Do you still remember in the blueprint for man, what God conceived about man was, let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness. And the reason why man was to be designed according to God's image is so that man can be a carrier of God's authority. Image is to authority as likeness is to representing God. We are created in the likeness of God so that we can have this privilege of representing God. We are created in the image of God so that we can be carriers of his authority. You see, God, even though he has a plan for someone's life, may not be able to fulfill his plan for that individual's life if he doesn't have the opportunity to exercise his authority over the life of that individual. If we go to town and you see one of the guys managing the buses in town and your eyes are open and you see him from the realm of the spirit and you see that he was ordained to be an evangelist. Meanwhile, he is far from what you saw. The reason why he's far from what you saw and he may never be what you saw, even though it is ordained by God, is because he has not yet decided to present himself in such a place where God can exercise his authority over his life. So even though God has a plan, God may not be able to imp implement the plan because the individual is not within the scope of the reign of God's authority. So when we say the reign of heaven is at hand or the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the requirement is repent. Repent because the reign of heaven is at hand. The authority of heaven is coming to the earth. But if you don't repent, that authority will not be able to manipulate you and produce the intention of God concerning your life through your life. Are you there? So the extent to which we submit with God, submit to God, is the degree to which God finds the opportunity to make out of our lives that which he has ordained. So your complete committal to God is a requirement for God to manifest his intentions through your vessel. So if God now, are you there? The greatest the greatest hindrance that God will have in implementing his purpose in your life is that you are not absolutely yielded to him. So you are yielded to him a little and you also have allegiance to Ogugu in the village. That is going to obstruct the scope of his authority 
that is being administered over your life and the, the jealousy of God will be provoked in that situation because God will not have the opportunity to implement his program to the full extent. Instead, because you have not given him the full ground to operate in your life, um, he will even begin to judge you. His nature of jealousy will release him to become an object of judgment over your life because you have not given him the place for him to exercise his intention. In order for God to have legitimacy, to demand that you submit to him totally, he arranged for the procurement of your salvation by himself and paid your bright price through the blood of Jesus Christ so that he can have that level of legitimacy that he needs to implement his program in your life. So it's therefore illegal for a believer whose salvation was procured through substitution. Jesus released what he was and became what we, we were so that we can release who we are and become what he was. It's supposed to be an exchange program. It's supposed to be an exchange that will be accomplished through salvation because it was procured by the wisdom called substitution. So when someone gives his life to Christ, and instead of him allowing God to do through him what God wants, and he decides that he wants to be what he wants, and he has received salvation, it is a state of illegality because salvation was gotten through substitution. And he's therefore not supposed to live his life in the current state, powered by his own will, but his life is supposed to be powered by the will of God. This is the reason why there are believers that God will resist, because the person is going against the principle for which and through which and by which God was, God procured their salvation. Now, this is what God said. He says, um, he speaks about idol worship when we create substitutes instead of him. Instead of us to recognize, according to the book of Colossians where I read to you yesterday, the Bible says that we are complete in him who is the head of principality and power. We are complete in him. The reason for that statement, we are complete in him, is to make you understand that uh, 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 you are complete, so you don't need to add Ogugu to the equation. You are complete, so you don't need to add marine powers to the equation. The moment you do that, you have provoked God's jealousy. And God is going to administer judgment because you are praying on his rights. You are praying on his domain. You are praying on his property. Have you ever imagined how a married man that loves his wife like myself will behave when you try to violate his wife in front of him? Think about it. Even the gentlest of men, you might find him operate in a strange way. The reason is because jealousy is involved. Any kind of love that does not accommodate jealousy is not true love. Hallelujah. You are not following me. I say hallelujah. Hallelujah. If it doesn't accommodate jealousy, it's not true love. Because jealousy is saying, I want to have you all by myself. It is, it is when that situation is fulfilled that I can manifest my good pleasure in the fullest extent through your life. So that's how God is. He is He's a jealous God. So if by any means we have uh, an idol that is taking the place of God, He's given us an insight into what will happen. He say, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. 
Now, uh, I need to explain a little. And the reason why I need to explain is because um, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That's a scripture that we normally present in such matters. But I need to show you um, the matter here. I want to keep the name of the person I want to talk about secret. There is a very powerful man of God that used to preach in Nigeria some years ago. And this powerful man of God came to the city of Kaduna to preach. The, the organizers of the event that he was coming to minister went to the government and got security for this man of God. The orderly or the personal security that was attached to him, it is through him we got this information. So they were in a, a particular location because I believe that the, the stadium, Kaduna Township Stadium, was the venue for the event of the crusade. So they were within one of the cubicles in the stadium. And some individuals that were from another faith did not want the crusade to hold. So what they did was that they paid some homeless young individuals to begin something like a protest and a riot. The policeman that was his personal assistant was close to him when this man of God bent his head quietly and said, Lord, make all of them blind. I'm talking about something that happened in Kadun, not in heaven. It happened among the sons of men. Make, the prayer was not very audible, but because the Security guy was standing by his side. He heard every bit of the prayer. Make all of them blind. And instantly, all those people that were doing something like a riot went blind instantly. Wait, I've not finished. Do you know that those blind people, they married and they gave birth to blind children. And those blind children are still there today. Yes. Name of preacher with hell. Those children are still blind today. There is a part of the city of Kaduna where they stay. The, the policeman took his, his son, that was a notorious man, took him and drove him to that place and see, see the children of the people that the man prayed against. They were born blind. That was part of what influenced his own work with God. Are you still following what I'm talking about? You are not, you are, you are not with me. Now, may you understand that... that uh, okay, so I will not go beyond that. Those guys are still there till today. And the reason for their blindness, transgenerational blindness, came because someone prayed and invoked the jealousy of God. You know, many times when we talk about the jealousy of God, um, many of you don't know how potent it is when it goes to work. Like I told you before, do not trivialize any direct word spoken by the mouth of God. In view of the above scripture, the result of iniquity is a judgment that will implicate four generations. Are you there? Okay. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. I know that some scholars of the book of Romans are looking for an opportunity to jump at me now because of my use of the book of Exodus chapter 20. So be at peace, be just, it's okay. It's okay. Romans chapter 12, chapter five, 
from verse 12 to verse 14. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Can you stay there? Can you stay there? Let us try to explain that scripture. Sin came into the world by one man. So how come the consequence of sin passed on all men? What's the principle at work here? It's the principle of inheritance. Okay, you are not following. Next verse, next verse, verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, in, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. It was Adam that sinned the sin that brought death into our ecosystem. And that death was factored upon us, even though we had not sinned the kind of sin that Adam sinned. So the question is, why is it that Are you following me? Why is it that Adam did not just pay for his own sin? And then we will not be given an opportunity whether we want to sin or not. How come the consequence of Adam's sin passed on all men? Such that in the, in the justice system of God, it is written, for all have sinned. I've told you, and um, during the course of this lecture, I've, I've, I've asked you to underline the word inheritance a number of times. A number of times. Actually, there are two words that I wanted you to underline for so many times before we get to this day. One of the words is iniquity, and the second word is inheritance. The reason why sin passed on all men, death, which is the consequence of sin, passed on all men, even on such men that have not sinned after the transgression of Adam, was because of the principle of inheritance. Adam was the only man at that time, and Adam was a carrier. It was his womb that carried all of us. And a mutation took place that affected all humankind, even before we were born. And that's the reason why Jesus had to come to create another alternative race. Because everyone that came from Adam was a victim of the mutation that took place because Adam mutated before he was able to produce children. If there's no mango in Nigeria and it's only in India, there's mango. And we go to India to get mango. And then while we were bringing the mango, a chemical a chemical was poured on the mango and the leaf became yellow. If they bring that mango and plant here and mango begins to grow with yellow leaf, you would think that mango originally has yellow leaf. And if that's the only species, the only strand of mango that grows on the continent of Africa, if you come to Africa, you will see mango with yellow leaf and we will conclude that mango has yellow leaf because the original seedlings of mango that were being ferried into the territory experienced an accident, experienced a mutation, and they are going to produce mangoes after the accident, after the order of that accident, after the order of that mutation. So I want you to understand that in spiritual things, we cannot overemphasize the place of inheritance. We can't overemphasize it. So it is possible that there is a judgment that is in your family. And the reason for which that judgment is in your family is because of idolatry that was practiced in your family once upon a time. Because God has said that his jealousy will compel him to visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children unto the third and the fourth generation. Unfortunately for us as African people, 
and many other races of men that may be under the sound of my voice there across the digital space. The unfortunate situation is that we have a natural heritage that has its roots so deeply situated in the heart of idolatry. Okay. How, what is the solution to this matter? Is the solution to the matter to pretend that um, the moment you come into Christ, you no longer suffer the fate of such one who is a victim of judgment because of the iniquity that was practiced in his lineage? Is that the solution to the problem? Whenever you see a situation in the scripture that is a legal situation, it's a justice, a judgment, which is coming out of the heart of God's justice system, never you think, never you think that something that is short of judgment, of justice, of, of legality will be the solution to that problem. If the problem resulted because of a judgment that derives from God's justice system, it will require God's justice system to find the solution within that context that will undo the problem. For instance, I've seen a lot of people that believe that Faith denies mountains. The moment you became born again, no legalities don't exist anymore. You have you are just just begin to live your life. You will live your life, and the same symptoms that are bound with the unbelievers in your family will also abound in your life. The Bible says if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. You will say unto this mountain, that means faith does not deny the presence of mountains. Faith equips you to be able to contend with mountains, not to deny mountains. Now, the average believer likes this trick of denying that mountains exist on the account of his faith, instead of him to be brought to the understanding of the fact that because I have faith in Jesus Christ, I can now stand against these mountains legally and enforce the will of God in my new context. Even if you have a verdict that is not enforced, it is useless. It means your condition will be a condition of depravity because you have not paid attention to enforcement. Faith is going to empower you to come against mountains. Faith does not deny that mountains exist. Now, the average believer takes this road of, this comical road of denying that there's no problem. The moment I am born again, I am translated. Indeed, that is your reality in the spirit. It's your reality positionally. But even though you are translated in the spirit, are you there? How many of you? Are you there? Yes, sir. Did Jesus pay for your sickness? Did he pay? Yes. You have scriptures to prove that? Yes. Have you ever fallen sick since you gave your life to Christ? Yes. <laughs> because we don't think logically. If after you gave your life to Christ, Jesus paid for your sickness, you still fall sick. It means that the things Jesus paid for will not just naturally begin to work in your life. You have to enforce it. Whereas it is customary in the faith lane for people to enforce their faith against sickness. The average believer doesn't want to enforce his faith against the speakings of iniquity. The average believer is used to using his faith to fight sickness. Even, and the reason why it is fighting the sickness is because he knows that Jesus paid for it. But has he asked himself, why is the sickness still coming? Why didn't you just disappear? Because it's been paid for. That's the same way that symptoms that are associated with iniquity will not just fade away. 
but your new position of being translated in Christ Jesus gives you a legal ground from whence you can enforce the reality of your new position. The average believer doesn't do that when it comes to things that are established on premises, very legitimate premises that find expression within the scope and within the gradient of the bloodline. He doesn't do that because he's expecting it to be automatic in that particular matter. Meanwhile, it is not automatic in sickness and disease. Any verdict that you have received in the spirit that has not been translated through implementation, through enforcement, that verdict is not going to be efficacious in your life. God, when you give your life to Christ, God does not deliver you from battles. He gives you equipment to fight. And that's the way of Christianity. You know, there was a time where the average believer felt, are you with me? When you give your life to Christ, the next vision is for you to go to heaven. Because this religious mentality of being taken away from problems, it's a very soothing deception. If God wanted us in heaven, rapture would have been raptured. The moment, as you are saying this in our prayer, rapture, the rapture vehicle will just come and move you away. I don't have, I did that teaching some time ago. Huh? The midway free of salvation, midway free. There, there are four things that are associated with salvation. Hi. Hey. You people forget everything I teach. This midway free of salvation, at the end of the message, we're able to see through scripture that salvation equips you for life. It equips you to engage life. Yeah. It is not a system by which you are evicted from the scene of tension. It equips you for life. So the escapist mentality of thinking that salvation salvation has undone everything and your own participation in enforcement is no longer required is a deception that has kept people in captivity and bondage all their lives if we are going to be the victorious church then we must follow the way of our ancestors our ancestors that acknowledge that faith does not deny the mountains but faith equips you to be able to engage the mountains. And I'm telling you like a man that had to come into conflict with the power of necromancy that was ravaging my own immediate family. We were born again. But at the heart of our natural reality was the altar of necromancy. The keepers of the city steps, the people that uh, were in league with uh, the realities of the regions of darkness were my blood people. Oh, you don't need a dictionary to know what it means when the Bible says something is called the shadow of death. <laughs> because when you are, you are a relative to necromancies, uh, necromancers, you will see the shadow of death cast again and again around, and it has the ability to sniff out life from people seasonally. There's going to be a science around death in the family. Three people go at once, then there's rest for three years. Four people go thereafter, then there's rest again for another three years. You can actually calculate and draw a slope, plot a graph of death, and capture the slope. The slope we are you, are you still with me? Yes. The slope that we drew sometimes ago realized, revealed that the life expectancy, the oldest man that is going to be among us will be 60 years. Because he's going to die either at 62 or 64. He's going to die at 67 or 65 because there was a science around life expectancy among our people. It will, be, it will be an act of irresponsibility for you not to roll your sleeves and your trousers and step into the fight. Tonight, we want to step into the fight. You've been running for all, all this while, quoting scriptures, and people have been dying in your family. 
<laughs> it is time for you and me to do what? Step into. You are still afraid. That, that's the problem. You come to church and you are trying to build people to think through the lens of scriptures and they are afraid of their village. They are afraid of the name of their grandfather. Please help me preach your neighbor. It's time to step into the fire. You were saying it as if. <laughs> Let's try it again. It's time. Now, let me show you the position of scripture quickly so that. Uh, Are you there? Can we do... Um, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18. So whenever you study your Bible, don't, don't pick and choose. If you want to study a subject, take your time. It takes four days to study a subject. It takes four good days to study a, a subject of eight hours. Eight hours impute every day for four days to study once. If you want to study faith, take you four days. And your investment in terms of time is going to be eight hours per day. The reason why it is like this is you must study every scripture in the Bible that talks about faith in order for you to understand the doctrine of faith. The, when, when you get the doctrine, it means you have all the spare parts of that particular truth put together as one exclusive pool of spiritual reality. It's not as if you pick a few that look like your pet doctrine, look like the doctrine of your church. You pick a few that look like what the people say in your fellowship. No, you get the entire spectrum of truth that is connected to that particular doctrine. Then you can understand the mind of God on that matter. Exactly. Now, if you operate that way, you will discover that the position of, of, of Scripture on various matters are, are not in the same shape as what you believe. And then purging will begin to take place. Alignment and adjustment will begin to find expression. Then you are going to be an object of truth. Your life will now become aligned to the whole truth on the matter. Your position will be representative of what God conceived before he began to unveil those realities in the scriptures. In the labor of the scriptures, we don't pick and choose. We study the entire counsel of God. Especially now where people use the Bible to lie, use the Bible to steal, use the Bible to manipulate the destinies of people. Oh my God, we need to do the labor that makes us worthy. Such men that, that God can trust to deliver a generation from the darkness that has besieged them. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 18, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, What mean ye that he used this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grape, and his children's teeth are set on edge. What he's trying to tell us is there is the argument here is the argument of why the principle of inheritance should be the basis of the bondage of other people. It is the fathers that committed the challenge. Why is it that the children's teeth are set on edge? And they are set on edge because of the provisions of and the power of inheritance. For instance, if there's idolatry in the family, there's a judgment that is going to be transgenerational and it will be sustained for four generations. And this is a decree that came by the mouth of God. If you hear God speak, huh? are you there? Yes, in scripture, don't ever say it is Old Testament. You will become the first victim of foolishness. For you to hear God speak in the Bible, 
and then you now say you rationalize and say it's Old Testament. That's the cheapest way for you to live as a slave, even within the context of the new covenant. We don't operate by faith by denying the mountains. We don't operate by faith by ignoring what God has said. We search the scriptures to find the provisions that God has made available to override that program. Denying that the program does not exist does not strip you of his power. He said, he said, as I live, said the Lord God, he shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. For all the souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so is the soul of the Son, is mine. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So this is an amendment. You see, in 1999, there was an amendment of the Petroleum Act. It was the amendment of the Petroleum Act that led to the creation of my office. Prior to 1999, the Petroleum Act was in a certain way that did not recognize my office. So a certain problem was predominant in the distribution of petroleum products in Nigeria. And that problem could not be addressed by the previous act that existed. And when they analyzed the problem, they came back to the table and generated an act that included the establishment of a new agency that will be directly involved in the monitoring and the distribution of petroleum products. And that was what took away queues from the filling stations for eight straight years. And in the ninth year that queues came back, it was because the government decided to ignore our suggestions. When the queues came back, they now realized how vital we were. And they gave us more powers. The act was even adjusted for that to accommodate more powers and more authority. What you are seeing in the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 is an amendment. It means that new laws now apply. In order for our rights to be exercised on a higher pedestal. The reason why we, we, and we amend laws is so that we can revisit the scope of our rights and possibilities. So there's an amendment. And on the strength of this, notice that it is the law that was amended. Oh my, you're not here. The strength of this amendment provides that we should not be victims of inheritance. If there are positive things in the inheritance lane, you can accept them by faith. And if there are negative things, there is an amendment that gives you the right to be able to confront inheritances that are inconsistent. Are you following? So don't, don't ignore it. No, you will die. I've seen good men die. Noble men were caught up by legal issues that swept them out. And they still died within the framework of expectation as established by the demonic re regulations within the framework of their plan. The soul of the Father is mine. The soul of the Son is mine. And the soul that sinned, it shall die. It is the exercise of a man's will that will determine whether he becomes a victim. So, if I am standing on better promises, established upon better foundations, I have a legal position to prosecute my case before the justice system of heaven. The issue we are dealing with it's an issue that is a result of a direct utterance from God. And whenever God speaks, his words become law. And he himself becomes subject to the things that he has said. 
So if you are going to counteract that, you will do that using an amendment. Because God, he will never, his words will never return unto him void. If he speaks, he stands. The realm of the spirit is adjusted to accommodate the new, the new policies that God has implemented on the account of the exercise of his authority. He said, the soul of the father is mine. The soul of the son is mine. And it is a soul that sins that will die. I've told you stories about necromancers. But the traditional way of combating necromancy is that you ensure that your feet never touches the ground. Because if you travel on British Airways and you land in London and you pull off your stockings and you stand on the ground, you will appear in the mirror. Kilebo <laughs> Korea. Amante Ura. Mm. That tongue I spoke is the state. <laughs> Hallelujah. The second way is that ensure you don't drink water. Because the moment you drink water, even if you are in Spain, you are in, you are in France, on the Eiffel Tower, the, the, the thing will spot you. 17 meters above sea level. <laughs> but you know why we are alive? We enforced the amendment. So what we are here to do tonight is to, is to enforce the amendment so that the foundation of iniquity that is locked on your family, that is responsible for the judgment that has been manipulating the destinies of men, that foundation will lose the legal strength needed to influence your own life. Because the Bible says that the soul of the Father is mine. The soul of the Son is mine. And it's only the soul that sins that will die. Evangelist. Can you rise on your feet? God has put this together to ensure that no one, no one, no one among us becomes defeated by the forces of hell. That's why this is happening. Can you lift up your voice and thank God for the amendment? There is an amendment that ensures your victory. Oh my God. There is an amendment that ensures that you will not be defeated. There is an amendment that I ensures that you will not die prematurely. There is an amendment that ensures that that reproach that has traveled through your generation stops. A generation must arise and enforce the amendment. You are that generation. You are that generation. I say you are that generation. You are that generation. So can you just rejoice and thank God for this amendment? There is an amendment. It is the soul that sinned that shall die. You will not have to die again. Your teeth will not have to be set on the edge. No. No. No, 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 no. There is an amendment. Can you lift up your voice? There is an amendment online on site. Lord, we leverage on the amendment. We leverage on the amendment tonight. We leverage on the amendment. It is a soul that sinned that shall die. It is a soul that sinned that shall die. We leverage on the amendment. Can you pray that prayer? I leverage on the amendment. I live rage on the amendment. Tonight, you will bring to an end that civilization of darkness because you will operate as a law enforcement agency. You are here tonight as a law enforcement agency. Can you pray? I live rage on this amendment. It is a soul that sinned that shall die. Apatos Katina Haya. Eh, Yapandos Cabrina Sula. Mapela Satina Kapa. Ela Presa Tuli Bahaya. 
Basu la pila katina. Faith does not deny the mountain. Faith does not deny the problem. It empowers you. By the faith we have in the name of Jesus. Every ancestral inheritance stops. Every ancestral inheritance expires. Expires tonight. Expires this moment. Inheritances of sicknesses. Diseases. Strange ailments. We enforce the amendment bill. It is a soul that sinned that shall die. I will no longer pay the price. I will no longer bear the consequences of my father's sin. Cry to God. Enforce. La pe satanaya pa protos ketela in Jesus mighty name in Jesus mighty name as I was praying my spirit received a flash of a courtroom have you noticed that the judge that provides verdicts does not enter there with God he only says something, maybe right, and hits the hammer. But the enforcers of the law, they are equipped with all kinds of gadgets. So at the point of enforcement, violence can happen. That's why they have to go with a gun. The judge does not need a gun. So there is an amendment. It is, a, it is possible for the judge to give a verdict on the matter. If the enforcers don't come, the criminal may go scot-free. So it's not a time to be psychedelic. You are that law enforcement agency. So you, you, I want you to see yourself armed with AK-47. Because a verdict has been given. Oh God, nobody will have to die again. No. Nobody will have to run mad again. You are that law enforcement agent. Can you begin to enforce the law? Imagine that when they come a flag of the military with a gun in your hand. Somebody pray like you have never prayed before. This meeting is designed to set men free, to deliver people. Can you cry? Act like a law enforcement agency. Tell the devil the verdict has been passed. It is time to imprison you. The verdict has been passed. Can you cry? I want you to pray. Enforce the law. Enforce the law. Enforce the law. Enforce the law tonight. Nobody dies again. I arise to enforce the law. The verdict has been given. But I arise as a law enforcement agent. I arise, I arise as the military personnel, I arise to declare insanity we no longer hold, death we no longer hold, oh my God, reproach has ended, it has ended, the dominion of Satan Necromancy has ended. Ah, yes. Who is enforcing? Enforce, enforce the law. Enforce the law. There is a verdict. There is a verdict. There is a verdict. There is a verdict. In your favor. In your favor. Tonight. How you enforce the law determines your victory. Ah, in my family, no one dies anymore. In my family, no sudden collapse anymore. The symptom of rising and falling has ended. Can you pray? 
enforce, enforce, enforce. Enforce the law. 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 There is a law to enforce tonight. Ah, ya kalabatola. Mane Brazil appear. I arise as that law enforcement agency. I arise tonight to banish the activity of darkness. Ale Brazil. E capazata. Membre tola brita. Sambre taligata. Ale Brazil. Radesu. Brazatela. Can you pray? Can you pray? Every negative verdict of the devil, every negative verdict of necromancers, increase the tempo of your prayer. Increase the tempo of your prayer. Abba Sotalaba. Until I die. Gazata. Yes. 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 In Jesus mighty name. In Jesus mighty name. Now listen. A slave that loves his chain will be there for too long. Any slave that loves his chain will be in slavery for too long. Genesis 27 verse 40. By your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now, I think some of you are still comfortable with the problem. You are still okay. The devil has served you a meal that you must not eat tonight. There is a verdict that must end today. And every verdict you end today, will, you will have no reason to pray about it again. Because it will be deleted. It will be completely deleted. Now, I want to stir up your spirit. I like you to be angry. Mentalize that problem. I was serving in Ogugu many years ago. I went to the house of my student. And she told me that every year somebody died from their family. Now, so it's no longer about death. They know that somebody must die. So at the end of every year, they will look at themselves. Who is the next person going? So everybody will look at who is the next person. Now, I don't know the civilization that has prospered hitherto in your family. He said, when you become restless, I want to equip you on how you are going to pray now. Listen to me. Don't look at the next person around you. A platform has been given us. An advantage has been given us. A decree has been made. A change of policy has been made. An amendment has been made. Now, God is saying you are the law enforcement agent. See yourself as that military man with AK-47. If you want to move around, move around. But there is a demonic altar that must perish tonight. There is a demonic sentence that must cease to exist tonight. There is that death we no longer hold. Hear me, be tired, be tired, be tired. Until you become restless. I want you to serve the notice. I want you to arise tonight. Arise, arise, arise. And enforce the amendment. Enforce the amendment. Can you enforce? You can move around. You can sit on the floor. But make sure you are that law enforcement agent tonight. Papa to satire. Somebody pray. Praketo zapataya. 
Anda zebrata. Leta zatuna. There is an amendment. No more debt. I stand as a law enforcement agent in my family. Satan, your wreck has ended. Satan, your regime has ended. Demons of death, necromancers, you are bound. Your activities end tonight. Apatola, Kasha, Kasha Pela, Kapela Satuna. Pray yourself out. Pray your family out. Satan will no longer pray on my family. Yes, yes. Yes, it's a night of victory. It's a night of victory. It's a night of victory. Brasotalia. When you become restless, are you tired of that situation? Are you tired of that case that has repeated time and time again? It's a night of victory. It must expire. Evil verdicts must expire. Evil verdicts must expire. Ale poratana. Kapetonaya. Enforce. 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 The last one that happened will be the last. The last will be the last. No one dies again. Marita siege is lifted. Bodies are lifted. The spirit of death is lifted. I stand as the Messiah of my family. Savior shall arise. Savior shall arise from Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Israel. To judge by a verdict. By a verdict, by a verdict, Ella Pasota, Kepa Zatanaya, Zeta Pleta, Zepa Tola, Kepa Tazataya, Ele Kendeza, Ama Katosia, Ele Kepa Taya, Kapeta Zatania, Ela Green Tazuda, Ata. Satire, Satan the Peter, all the Peter Naya. Hey, hey! In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I want the sound of your amen to be ballistic. In the name of Jesus, you can make it better. In the name of Jesus. The last death that occurred is the last. You didn't hear me. The last death that occurred is the last. Because tonight we came with a verdict. The last misfortune that happened, that hung on the, in, on the power and the legality of inheritance will be the last your family will ever experience in the name of Jesus. Now hear me, I want to equip you with this prayer point and you're going to pray like you have never prayed before. The Bible says that Paul desired letters. He wanted a verdict to act. As wicked as his heart was concerning the believers, he could not do much without a verdict. And today God, we just freely received it. We freely received a verdict now. That was what Paul desired. Now, I want, to, I want you to weaponize this verdict that has been given. I need letters to go to Jerusalem. He, he went to the priests and desired letter. Now, I want you to look at yourself that there is a letter in your hand. Now look at the look at the content of the letter. 
Nobody dies prematurely again because the law has changed. There is a more in uh, the letter is written, there is a more power has ended. The letter is that that which that the chromes and your family, the powers behind his activities has been neutralized. That's now you have a letter in your hand. It says that young women will begin to marry again. The letter reads that nobody will be suddenly cut short again. The letter reads that the insanity that runs through your family, the legal hold has been destroyed. But there is an instruction. It says, take the letter with you. Take the letter with you. I want you to mentalize that. You are taking the letter. We have another 12 minutes. Take that letter. The verdict is that the soul that sin it shall die. I will not inherit what my grandfather did. No, now no. There is a letter I have. There is a letter. There is a letter I've received. Take that letter. Take that letter. You will bind those demons. It's just so that believers will be bound. Hold on, hold on, hold on. My God, hold on. Hold on, hold on. How will he bring the believers? How? So this letter enables you to bind demons. Enables you to bind necromancers. So you are going to bring them bound. Is somebody hearing me? You are going to bring them back bound. The powers of darkness will be bound. There is a letter in your hand. There is a letter in your hand that authorizes you to bind and put an end to that evil civilization. Can you go with that letter now? I want to see the efficacy of that amendment. Yes, there is an efficacy in that amendment. You will return with those demons bound. Those fetish powers bound. Necromancers bound. Untimely death bound. Spirits bound. Yes, you have an authority. You have an authority. You have an authority. Tepa Sota. Elisa. Kapa Tosataya. Kapa Tosataya. Kapa Nesataya. Ose Matulia. Ante Zapalia. Tapa Tolia. There is a letter. There is a letter. There is a letter. There is an authorization. There is an authorization in your hand that empowers you. That empowers you to bring to an end the activities of the devil. That empowers you to end evil orders. Yes. Yes. Use that letter. It's an amendment. Can you use it? Can you use it tonight? Can you use it tonight? Can you use it tonight? Yes! 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 All that's are breaking. 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 Lives have been liberated. Yes. 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 Are you sure you are using the letter? There is an authorization. Are you sure you are using the authorization? There is an authorization in your hand. In your hand tonight. There is an authorization in your hand tonight. So whether you will be free or not, Depends on you. Depends on you. Depends on you. Hey, sister, use that letter. It's a letter of execution. Yes, no more. Those that sat in darkness have.
have seen a great light. Those that move in the shadow of death has great light shine. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing. Sorrow and weeping shall flee away. Hey! Hey! Whosoever the Son of God shall set free shall be free. There is a verdict. My word that goeth forth from my mouth shall not return, shall not return, shall not return for it. He shall accomplish. He shall accomplish. There is an amendment rule. There is a rule of amendment. It is a soul that sinned that shall die. You shall live. 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 I pay no satan. In Jesus' mighty name. In the mighty name of Jesus. Before I give you the last prayer point, I saw a young lady here. There is an Iroko tree that has swallowed the glory of people in your family. And Lord showed me that you are by my right hand side. He, is good. he gave you a sword and you will travel. The lady I'm talking about will travel in the spirit now. You will travel because a sword has been given to you in the spirit. Your hand will become uncontrollable because, yes, yes, travel, 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 travel. That's it, travel, travel, travel. There's a journey, there's a journey, there's a journey. There's a journey. There is a journey. There's a journey. There are three that has swallowed the glory of men in families. Are collapsing now. That has swallowed the glory of men and women. It's collapsing now. It's collapsing now. It's collapsing now. It's collapsing now. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God, Lord, help me. There are three people I saw here. You were decorated, you are decorated with a garment. Because of the evil priesthood, you were supposed to be an intercessor, a global voice, but your glory has been localized. It was shortchanged. But God just showed me. He said, the, that handwriting of ordinance was just blotted as we were praying. And he said, you will be equipped with a new uniform. You will be equipped with a new garment. There are three of you. There are three people that will receive those garments. It's a white garment shining but still burning and I could see that it was not consumed there are three people in that category Lord show me where they are show me yes yes there are three of them yes yes that's it yes that's it yes 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 a new comment a new comment yes that's it oh my god my god my god he's a comment of fire he's a comment of fire just help them it's a garment of fire. Somebody, your shoe was stolen. Your shoe was stolen. Help me find that sister. An evangelist. An evangelist. The Lord is giving you the shoe of fire. The shoe of fire. Your legs will begin to burn. Your legs will begin to burn. Your legs will begin to burn. My God. You hear me? Just get somebody in the next three minutes and look at that person. Look at that person. Hold that person. Reuben was cursed. 
and every time Israel went to war, the Reubenites died in their thousands. The principle of inheritance was at work. They died until a man came. He said, there is a new verdict. And he looked at Reuben and said, Reuben, you shall live and not die. Say, Reuben, you shall live. Now, stand as a prophet over that person. Leveraging on the message, you have received a message that the, there is an amendment. Speak to that person and say, you shall live now. Say, I came with an amendment. And I have, I'm standing before you as a law enforcement agent. Whatever inheritance of darkness that existed before now, I pronounce by the authority I have as a, as a law enforcement agency in the spirit. Every such evil altar promoting that evil, promoting that misfortune, promoting that calamity, promoting that reproach, promoting that untimely death, ends now. I am equipped with the letter. I am equipped with an authorization from heaven. And I stand to declare every evil altar, every evil inheritance expires this moment, expires, 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 expires. In case that person is not making that pronouncement, just leave him and look for another. Expires. Let Ruben leave. Let Reuben live and not die. Let Reuben live and not die. You will live and not die. You are no longer subjected. Online on site. Online on site. Online on site. Online on site. No more debt. No more debt. No more debt. No more debt, no more reproach. We have the letter, we have the authorization, we have the authorization. The snare is broken, the snare is broken, the snare is broken. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My God, what a season. What a season. Hear me? You can go and celebrate. See, listen, I can, you can take this to the bank. If there is anybody here, online on site, and there is a predicament of untimely death, nobody will die again. No, I can See, Satan cannot challenge this. Let Reuben live. In case you don't agree me, I agree with the message. I have an authorization. I have received a letter. And I say, anyone under the sound of my voice, maybe in your own family, there is an inheritance that no matter how beautiful ladies are, they don't get married. It has expired. Oh, you, you don't, you don't, your amen sounds as if you don't believe. This year, you will get married. In case there are young people here, there is an inheritance of reproach in your lineage. The last one you saw is the very last. None shall find expression again. I say, leave, go and leave. Continue to leave. Every affliction 
that came to you on account of the principle of inheritance upon this altar and on the strength of the message we have received the revelation we have received that there is a change there is an amendment it is the soul that sin it that shall die you didn't sin you didn't engage in that evil so you will not smell it you will not smell it it will not find expression in your life let me hear a ballistic amen seven believing amen number one number two number three number four number five number six prepare for the seventh one after the seventh one you will jump you will rejoice you will live life you will embrace life you will bid farewell to the devil farewell to affliction farewell to reproach are you ready are you ready online on site number seven yes bid farewell yes yes yes